sorry, man. I don't like to break up fellowship. It's amazing to hear these voices and to see how many uh, men the Lord brought in the house this morning. I want to start out, uh, before we even get started, we, we just got to give God thankful, be thankful to the Lord and give Him gratitude for the amount of men that walked in the room this morning. I don't take it for granted. And one of our leaders came over to me and said, and we just got done uh, going and looking at a school for Rooted Right Ministries that we're going to be moving into and the doors that God is opening up. But I just looked at him and smiled and says, God knows what he's doing, doesn't he? And yeah, amen. And so I want to thank you for fighting to get here. You know, we call our Bible study on Thursday and Friday morning the fight. There's a reason for that. It's 6 a.m. in the morning. It's tough to get up. But we know we're fighting spiritually. And you guys are fighting for, to be the men of God that God created you to be. And you're fighting for your families uh, this morning. You're fighting for your marriages. And I thank you for being here. And so I don't want to take that for granted. Let me just go to the Lord in prayer to get started. Father, we love you and honor you. We come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you so much for all the men that woke up this morning. Thank you for putting breath in our lungs and bringing us together. Like-minded men. And walking together in one mind and one accord. Father, I pray that you would have complete control over this time. In fact, Lord, would you get me out of the way so that you may be glorified? Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this pr place. I pray that you would speak mightily and individually to each and every person, but also to us corporately as we gather together. You showed me on the way over here that we're just getting started, and Lord, you're building up an army for the kingdom. We thank you that you're raising us up for such a time as this and that we can be a new man in Christ today. No matter how we walked in, you can change us literally in this next half hour by us diving into your word. We thank you for that opportunity that you've given us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we get started on the message, about four weeks ago now, uh, it was a Sunday night, and my son had had uh, one of his friends over, and we were playing pickleball with the family. I give this kid a lot of credit, and it has to do with the book. Uh, that the Lord allowed uh, Pastor Clarence and I to write. So if you, if you haven't gotten one of these, uh, all of this stuff up here is free. I'm not going to take time today to talk about, uh, but this has had a great impact on our Bible studies, and many of these have already been done. Uh, and if you're interested in any of them, they're all free. They do no good sitting in my truck or in my garage until the next time we come together. So please take them. If, some, if the Lord puts somebody on your heart, take them. But it goes back to this book. I, I gave... Uh, my son's friend a book and he said well, what's it about and I said well it has to do with my testimony I said but then it's a leadership book I said it's a how to be uh, the spiritual leader of your household book and I said more than anything it's an accountability book and so he he took that but then we were playing pickleball later and he was sitting over on a bench and he comes he sits right next to me I give him a lot of credit for taking that step out Reminds me of any, any man, just like you coming here, taking a step of faith. He took a step of faith at, a, I, don't, I don't know if he's 20 or 21, came and sat next to me. He said, all right, so you told me the book was about your testimony. He says, what does Pastor Clarence have to do about your te with your testimony? And I, I kind of chuckled, and like I do when anybody asks me now, uh, has anything changed in your life or how you doing? I just look at you and say, how long you got? Uh, but I just smiled and I said, you know what, first of all, thanks for asking. Second of all, I want to tell you, and I was looking at my family out there playing pickleball because we were, we were taking time off while they were playing. We had six people. And I said, you see my family playing out there right now? I said, I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for Pastor Clarence. I said, you know that men's breakfast that we had the day before where we had a room full of men filled like this? None of that would have been happening. You know Rooted Right Ministries that you went to service on Sunday morning? None of that would have happened. And I said it was all because one man was obedient to make one call, and by the prompting of the Holy Spirit, the Lord telling him time and time again, call Andrew, call Andrew, call Andrew. And by the way, it took him 13 years to, to make that call. So those of you that have already forfeited yourselves and said, well, the Lord told me to do something a long time ago, and I missed my opportunity. If you got breath in your lungs... You did not miss your opportunity. But I said, you know what? None of that stuff happens. And in fact, right now, I'm probably in Las Vegas gambling my life away. I probably don't have a marriage and have ruined my relationship with my kids. And I'm out there living a life full of sin. And he looked at me and he's like, I never thought of it like that. 
You know? And so he was looking forward to reading about a testimony, but he didn't realize the impact that one man could have, and he didn't realize how many people, even right in front of him, we were enjoying just a night of pickleball and enjoying family night. Like, that would not have even existed if one man didn't step up and make that call. And so today, the question that we're going to pose today to ourselves is, are you a friend of God? Are you a friend of God? And I didn't ask if you believe in God. It's two totally different things. And the next question would be, how can you be a friend of God if you don't even know who God is? And so many times, as Deion Sanders did, as you'll read about in my testimony, but he told him this is not the full Bible, this is the New Testament. Don't take that wrong. I believe in the whole Bible, but I also believe in getting started and knowing who Jesus Christ is. This is the New Testament. Okay? So, and these are the Gospels. And so I encourage you to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John if you know nothing about who Jesus is so that you can actually make a decision about whether or not you even want to be a friend of God. And that doesn't mean that you know about God, that you've heard about God, that you heard somebody else testify like I'm doing up here. Do you know that my testimony is not for me? And I've already heard testimonies from some of these different tables and I've been part of the lives of many men in here. And I know that the testimony that God gave me may have spurned others on in faith. And now I'm watching God do amazing things in their lives. And now I'm watching that that switch that where it goes all about you and how do I get out of this bad situation? Lord, will you help me? Lord, will you be there for me? Lord, give me the strength to do this. And it's all about me, 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 me. It starts out like that. But God will show you when, wait a minute, you restored my life and renewed my mind so that I can now speak into this gentleman's life i can now speak over my kids i can now stand up and be the man of god that you've always called me to be but i'm wondering if you really call him a friend because let's think about what a friend is a friend is not somebody you call when you're in trouble and that's the only time that you call them that's called a a lawyer a doctor an accountant a therapist and you know what those people are only your friend in the moment right and think about what you do in those moments you almost completely surrender your life over to them. You're like, I am so messed up. Something's really hurting. Doc, will you help me? I'm, I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to do what you say. But what do you do, as most men do, at least I know I do, the minute I'm starting feeling better <laughs> and Doc told me to stay on the plan, keep doing my rehab, and you want to be feeling good in five years, not five weeks, I'm like, oh, that doesn't apply to me. That applies to everybody else. It's time for me to get back on the pickleball court. It's time for me to get back on the racquetball court. It's time for me to get start doing something that I shouldn't be doing. And we forget about our friend that was trying to help us. And if you think about how we've treated God over the course of our lives, I'm not saying that you haven't gone to Him. I'm not saying that you haven't asked Him for help. I'm not even saying that you don't believe in Him. What I'm asking you today is, are you a friend? And a friend, you do life together. A friend you actually care about and talk to and seek and communicate. And it's not just about you. We've all had friends that (laughs) it's all about them, right? You get with them, they want to talk about themselves. They're asking you for help. They're always asking you to be the one to step in and do something for them. And And at some point, you're thinking, man, there's no give and take here whatsoever. God is always, always, always trying to get something to us. Always. If we let Him, but we do not serve a forceful God. So he will not make you do anything. That should be good news to you, but it also is it's kind of uh, it's wild to think about that we actually have that much power. God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, but he's asking his people to open up their heart as he stands at, at, at your heart and knocks. He's asking you to open up your heart and let him in. Not just one time. Not just one time for salvation that says, I need a Savior. Lord, I know I'm messed up and I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me and can I spend the rest of my life in eternity? And you have that prayer moment and it's powerful and it's amazing and it's life-changing in the moment. But then you go out in this world and there's no discipleship as we're seeing or there's no men's group on Thursday or Friday morning or there's no Saturday, at least once a month, momentum. And what happens? The things that the preacher was saying all of a sudden start getting watered down or start to diminish a little bit or it didn't turn out the way that you planned it in your mind when you gave your life to the Lord. And all of a sudden, guess who you blame? Guess who we blame? We end up blaming God. And many times, many men end up getting mad at God because it didn't turn out the way you thought it would. And if we're really honest with ourselves and we look at ourselves in the mirror, 
Can you really call yourself a friend of God? I was with somebody yesterday and it was awesome because they said, you know what? Even though I kind of had elements of faith in my life, I was a, a youth leader. Uh, you know, I was part of my church. I, I did uh, Christian camps in the summer. Uh, you know, I, I, I have faith. I certainly know the Bible. I've read it. He said, but for the first time in my life, I truly got before the Lord, before this decision I had to make for me and my family. And I said, Lord, I'm going to pray and fast, and I'm going to put the total control for the first time. He's like, I, I think I, I realized that I was thinking of myself like I was self-sufficient. And I would add a little bit of God in whenever I needed it. But it wasn't a total surrender that whatever you have for me, Lord. And so for the first time in his life, and I don't care what age you are, it's the most amazing experience that you'll ever have when you actually get yourself out of the way. And then you don't play out the end results. The Bible says the plans of a man are many, but the will of the Lord will prevail. So we're doing this constantly because, you know what? The Lord's given us the opportunity to be visionaries. The Lord's given us the opportunity to speak into our atmosphere and to, and to help everyone around us. And the, and the people like our wives and our children and our businesses and those that are, we have influence on, they're looking for that. They need that and they want that. And the Lord's given us a gift to do that, but we've taken advantage of that. And we've spoken it in our way. And the people around you, the Bible says, follow me as I follow Christ. So the people around you, whether they know it or not, because the truth is put down inside of you, that's pretty cool to think about too. And we actually want to do good. I've been studying a lot on that lately, and I've preached on it. If you want to go listen on YouTube to Rooted Right, I'm not trying to get you to go to Rooted Right Church. You're more than welcome to join us here at 9.30. We're moving over to uh, Token Springs Elementary School on September 8th. I'm not trying to take you from your church. But I got to study a little bit about how the Lord has put the truth down inside of you and that you actually inherently want to do good. I always sided with the the line from Paul that says, I don't do what I want to do and I do what I don't want to do. That's that battle between good and evil. That's that battle between your flesh and the spirit that we face every single day, which is why we're here fighting. And right now in this room, you are operating in the spirit. In fact, because of the faith that you're surrounded by, whether you're a believer or not, you're here to just check this thing out. You're not sure about this Jesus thing. You actually don't know if you would call yourself a friend. You're sitting amongst right now, there are some friends of God in this place. And you can't help yourself but be edified and encouraged and strengthened. I sat many times right where you are and in church services, seeing myself as God saw me, and I'd let the enemy steal it by the time I got to my car. But while I was in here, I was making some, some connections with the Lord, and the Lord was showing me what He had for me, but I wasn't strong enough to do it on my own, which is where I'm going with all this. The reason why we wrote that book is we were never meant to do it alone. You have your own unique, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, yes, but it's a relationship. And then He put us on earth to have a relationship with each other and to stand in the gap for one another. So what the world has told us is a weakness is actually a strength. And I want to get that to each and every man. Whatever lie you've been believing that says we should just pull up our bootstraps, be able to figure it out all on our own, just act tough, plow through it, you'll make it, you you just keep on grinding away. No. In fact, when I played baseball, pro baseball, and this is so sad, I had tremendous talent. and I was one of their top prospects for the Toronto Blue Jays. They had great plans for me to do great things in the big leagues. And I had a, a problem with making errors <laughs> at, thir- at third base. In fact, I led, led the league in errors for two years in a row. <laughs> and it was wild that I believed the lie that if you went and saw the, they call it like an EAP program, uh, employee assistance or something like that program then. But if you even said that word in our locker room, that meant you had like uh, some mental problem or you, were, like, you, you, you weren't good enough. Like if you, if you forfeited yourself and says, I need to go see the EAP person, that was a sign of weakness. So what did I do every day in my locker? Probably hoping and wishing I could go talk to that person knowing that I had something going on in my head that I couldn't get out so that I could perform to my best ability. And yet I'm believing the lie that I shouldn't do that. Well, now look at the world we live in today. You, you think things have changed a little bit about the perception of mental health? What are we encouraging everybody to do? You know, talk about it, to get it out. And you know why? It's because we bring those things from the dark into the light. And you actually see that it empowers you when you speak it. And you actually start to realize that there's people alongside of you, and we're finding this out, especially on Thursday and Friday morning. It's amazing when a brother will share something that he's struggling with and how many guys in that room can help 
in many different ways. Maybe it's in the gifts and talents that they have. Maybe it's in the jobs that they have available. Maybe it's in their faith and their prayer life. Maybe they're going to walk right alongside that person and call that guy, lift him up in prayer, see how he's doing, come alongside him, meet together with him for breakfast or lunch, and it's happening. I saw a guy yesterday, Josh right there, who was with FCA, and uh, he's got his own ministry stuff that he's doing, but we just happened to run into each other yesterday. I can't tell you what a blessing it was to listen to him who gets to kind of engage once a month or, or every once in a while and see from the outside what's going on here at Rooted Right and at One Call Men's Ministry. And he says he's, he's great at facilitating conversations, so he starts talking to the men when he's in here. And he's now gotten to see over the course of the year or so, or a little bit more, the changes that are going on in the men sitting at the table. And so I started hearing this morning, like, it's happening. Like the, the, the stuff that God is asking us to do when we actually start to apply it, we're seeing that the Word of God doesn't come back void, and it's happening. This testimony of one call and this great thing, I've had so many people that I feel like when I'm talking to them, they're like, oh, that's great, Andy. I'm glad God turned your, your life around. That's so good for you. And you got this thing going on in your mind like, what about me? And can God do that for me? Yes. God is no respecter of persons, and I mean nothing in that other than to encourage your faith. That book, by the way, as I told you last time, and I'm going to keep saying it, some people will not pick up the Bible because they're believing so many lies about the Bible. Oh, it was written by man, or I'm not sure I can trust it, or it contradicts itself. Or, I mean, you go on YouTube or whatever those other social media crap that I don't even look at, uh, you, you can get fooled in a heartbeat about who God is. Would you let God reveal who God is to you? Let God do it. There's only one person that can reveal it to you, and then you get to make the decision. So I'm here this morning to ask you, have you ever really let God fill in the blanks about who He is? And how can you do that unless you are willing to actually read His Word? So there's two Scriptures here. There's actually lots of Scriptures that I want to get to. And Scripture is the only thing that changes us, by the way. And so I want to get to these. In James 4.4 it says, You adulterous people. That means we're giving our attention, our time, our energy, our strength outside of the things of God. And we're finally, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're videoing this now, so you'll be able to go back and, and see these scriptures if something hits you, okay? You'll be able to watch this again. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Ouch. I never once in my entire life, man, would have put myself in the, never once in my entire life, would have put myself in the category of enemy of God. Yet if you would dissect the way I was living my life, God cannot go against His Word. And so if you're positioning yourself and you're planning and you have known planned sin in your life and you refuse to learn more about the one that created you, you are literally positioning yourself as an enemy. Now you are not an enemy. He absolutely loves you. I hope you don't get me wrong right there. You are positioning yourself as an enemy. And so, how do you know if you're a friend of God? Look at what Matthew 7, 17 through 23. And this is what I was talking about when Josh said there's change happening. He can see it in the people. And it's starting to spread out. And don't think you've missed out on anything. That's another lie. Oh, well, these guys have been doing it for two or three years, so uh, I, I missed the boat. Maybe next time. Please do not put God in a box. You have no idea if He wants to change your life in one heartbeat or if it's going to take a year. And I don't know either. And I'm not going to try and play that role, but I will say that God's got a plan for it. And you did not miss out on one thing if you're sitting here under the sound of my voice. Matthew 7, 17-23, it says, Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit. So we, we actually we got this thing where we can't judge each other. No, we're not the judge. I love what... Uh, Actually, James said it. Thank you. I used it on sermon on Sunday, and I'm using it again today. All right, uh, and and it says that um, I'm nobody's savior, and I'm nobody's judge. Okay, so this is not for me to judge. We have an ultimate judge, but you know, think about the people you love the most. You can tell when something's wrong. You can tell that they're hurting. You can tell that there's a little bit of fear going on. There's some anxiety. Maybe there's some depression, or there's something off with them. You can tell. Especially if you're a man of God and you're sensitive to that and you're actually praying and care for people. But it says every good fruit bears good fruit. But every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. But a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. 
Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So that's how we judge, per se. Not everyone, this is a tough one. Uh, Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Look at this. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? I just want to pose any questions. Did anybody do any of those this week? You were prophesying in the name of Jesus. You were driving out demons. And you were performing miracles. Even those that were doing that, watch. It says, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. I never had your heart. I never had all of you. I never had your trust. You were not a friend of me. And in, in, in essence, when he's calling us an adulterous people, we were using him. And guess what? His word doesn't come back void. So guess what? You can choose to use him if you want to. I used to have this thing all the time like, Lord, why are you blessing these? This is when I was in baseball. Why do these guys have all these amazing contracts? And of course, then when I thought it was a big deal to have money and cars and everything else, they had, why are, like, they're, living, they're not living a very good life. Why are they able to do that? Do you know that God's principles do not come back void? So if you use God's principles in business, you'll be successful. It has nothing to do with being a friend of God. So you'll see, as you read in the Bible, there's another guy that I meet with, and I told him all along, I used to go to these, you know, uh, when, when you're in baseball, you get around great coaches, and they have unbelievable uh, speeches, and you got motivational people that come in, you got people that are great positive thinkers. And I used to think, man, they're amazing. Look, that message was so unbelievable. That really was, that really was motivating. I wish I could think like them. I wish I could be like them somehow. How do they get that type of attitude? How do they see the world that way? And then I read the Word of God. And I went, <laughs> they just plagiarized, right out of the, which is what we're supposed to do. They just took the principles of the Word of God and they started speaking. And you know what? Many times did not attach the power that comes from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to it, but they used the Word of God and His principles. And they spoke those things over us. And guess why it felt so good? Because God's Word doesn't come back void. And what did I say earlier? The truth is down in us. So when I say something from the Word of God, something inside of you goes, oh, that makes sense. That sounds good. And that's why we have to be careful about where it came from and what's the actual truth. And so are you willing to dive into the Word and see what Jesus said about it in His Gospels? You may say, well, well, maybe I can't go as far, now that you've said that, uh, maybe I can't go as far to put myself in the friend category of God. I'd like to be there, but maybe I'm not there. But at least I have faith. And at least I believe in God. Amen. I'm not diminishing that in any way. But look what it says. These two Scriptures really stuck out to me this week. In Hebrews 11.6, it says, and without faith it is impossible to please God. Now, when I think about God, the word impossible doesn't even exist. In fact, it says in the word that we can do all things through Christ. All things are possible through Christ who will strengthen us. That's what I keep telling myself. So this is telling us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards. This is some good news here. He rewards those who earnestly seek him. So we don't serve him for the rewards but that's just the kind of god that we serve and if you get around anybody that's been serving god and is a friend of god you're going to hear about the rewards of those who have been earnestly seeking him and know you didn't miss out on anything yet now watch how this links up with romans 10 17 so we just said it's impossible to please god without faith okay so we know faith is important romans 10 17 says consequently faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the Word about Christ. So this is one of those rubber meets the road moments. These are one of those tough conversations you have between you and God. You owe nothing to the person sitting next to you. You owe no, uh, nothing to the pastor sitting here. You no, owe nothing to your friends and your family. This is between you and God. If you're going to tell yourself that you're a man of faith and not be in the Word of God, you're just fooling yourself. Because right here it says in 10.17, and God's Word is truth, 
is that faith comes from hearing the message, which we're doing. We're preaching the message. You're hearing the truth from the Word of God. You're hearing a testimony. By the way, testimony in the Hebrew means God do it again. I love that, and I want to get that to some people that don't go to Rooted Right. Testimony, when you're testifying to somebody about what God's doing in your life, you're actually speaking over the person that you're testifying. You're saying God do it again in their life with the same power and authority. Isn't that awesome? That all you're doing is telling what God's doing in your life and you're actually speaking it over the person that you're talking to. But it says that it comes from the message, which we're talking about, through the Word about Christ. And so how can we grow in our faith if that's truly what you want to do? If you want to say, I want to be a man of faith. I want to learn about what it means to be a man of God. I want to strengthen my faith. It says right here we cannot do that if we're not willing to get into the Word of God. And because of the world we live in now, there's no excuses. Maybe back in the day when I was growing up, I'd say, well, I don't really understand that book that they gave me in church at my Lutheran church. I, you know, I, I tried to read it. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't, I don't really understand it. Or you may have thought it was, it, you don't like reading. They're, they're, the Lord has taken away all of our excuses. The enemy has used that phone uh, for bad, but God wants to use it for His good. At any time, you can ask your Google or your Siri or whatever you use, what does the Word of God say about and whatever you want to fill that blank in with. And then I encourage you, whoever you've recognized that God has put in your life to help you grow in your faith, and it happens almost weekly on the Thursday and Friday morning Bible studies. Someone will throw out some scripture. They'll say, hey, I don't really, I don't really understand that. Or, you know what, I don't like that. I don't, I, don't like, I don't like what that says there. That really didn't make sense to me. And it's amazing that when they present what hit them in a certain way, we go, you go around the room and you watch God just start to work and dissect this thing and say, well, I, I understand what you're saying there, but that's not what that Scripture means to me. And then we go and see, what if we can't come up with it? Let's go and read some commentaries on it. Let's hear some pastors that have preached on that in the past. Those that have gone before us. Let's get a deeper understanding before we move on. And that's the issue with most of us. We want to move on. One of my buddies, Keith, said that even on Friday. He said, we keep on reading these books, and then when we're done, we move on to the next book. I want to know, what did God have for you in this book, and what are you taking with you? And so if you're not taking anything with you out of this breakfast, then maybe it's time to think about whatever God's speaking to you during this time together. Whatever God's speaking, I, how about chewing on that all week long? Chew on it. And asking, Lord, what, what, what does that mean for me? What do you want me to do with the message that I'm hearing this week? Let God reveal to you why the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Why you came here. I can promise you it wasn't just for free food. Faith in its most basic definition is this. Acting like God is telling the truth. Acting. James is a book of action. Acting like God is telling the truth. Not just saying in your mind, you know what, I believe. I, I, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I go to church. I have faith. And then I'm going to watch, not me, God's going to watch your actions on the back end of that. And so the more we know from the Word, He gives us an opportunity to act like He's telling the truth. Matthew 22, 36 through 38 says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Many of you that have been going to church have heard that before. This is the first and greatest commandment. So when I woke up this morning, it, it is not something that I have to try and make myself do. I actually learned it from a guy that we've uh, read many of his books. Uh, when he hits the ground with his feet, he says that the enemy says, oh crap, he's up again. But for me, the Lord has given me a different tagline. You can steal it. You don't have to be like me one way. You can ask the Lord for your own tagline. But when I wake up in the morning, I say, here we go, Lord. Here we go, Lord. That's the first thing out of my mouth every time. And, w and when I say that, I have to understand what that means. I need to be here, <laughs> present. My wife tells me that all the time. Be where your feet are. Are you here? Are you present? Or are you planning something right now? Are you, are you already on your vacation right now? Are you already doing your to-do list right now? Have you tuned me out? Are you here? We, we meant to do this thing together. Nobody's in isolation doing this thing alone. And if we let you go, we actually showing that we don't care about you. And Lord, even, even Jesus left the 99 to go get the one instead of just, hey, I got 99, that's amazing. No, there's one sheep over there that's being left. We're going to go get them and bring them back. Okay? Here we go. There's always action. 
Uh, Randy and I say all the time, if you're serving the Lord, you won't be bored. When I was serving the things of this world, I was bored until I could feed my flesh whenever that next time was, and I was on the countdown to feed my flesh. These days, there's not enough time in the day. They go so fast, it's unbelievable, and God always has something for you every single day. There's always a go. And guess what? Sometimes the go is don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Because we get ourselves so busy and going, and then all of a sudden I'm run down, and Lord, this can't possibly be me. I don't feel like I'm close to you. I don't feel like I can hear from you. But I'm doing everything you're asking me to do, and I'm running all over the place. And he was asking you to be quiet and listen and sit and learn. You can ask for discernment about what season you're in. Here we go, and then Lord. Is He really Lord of your life? Is He the, the one that's sitting on the throne of your heart? There's only space for one. And many times we push Him off, and then we let Him back on. And then we push Him off, depending on the circumstances that we find ourselves in. That's called fear of man. And nobody's exempt from it, including the man standing up here that's talking a tough game right now. Every day, I have to decide whether the person I'm talking to in front of me, the situation I got myself in, the conversation I'm in, about whether I have fear of man or fear of the Lord. <clears throat> and by the way, fear of the Lord is reverence, respect, and honor. It's not you standing there shaking. I better do this, otherwise God's going to strike me down with a lightning bolt. I respect, I honor, and out of reverence, Lord, of what you've done for me, I'm going to stand for you. And the Word of God says, if you stand for the Lord here on earth... He'll stand for you in heaven. That's being called a friend to God. If you do that commandment that we just said, love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and you act like God is telling you the truth, the Word of God will finally come al alive in your life. And isn't that what we want? An authentic, true experience with the Lord. Isn't that what we want? We want to know that God is actually real. Well, you know what? You bring how, God re how real God is into your life. That's the power that He's given you. All the power comes from Him when you surrender over, but you're the one with the power to let Him in to your heart and mind. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. How can we know if God is real and true if we don't truly know Him? And how can we get to know Him without being in His Word and living out what He, the One who created us, is asking us to do. <coughs> In 2 Timothy 4 7, and we're finishing with this, it says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. That means if you're sitting in here, you're not done with your race yet. I have kept the faith. We can hear every single one of us, every one of us in this room, if you want to make that commitment to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, every one of us can hear someday. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Matthew 16, 15 says this. <clears throat> and this is where Jesus asked Peter. And He's asking us this today. But what about you? He asked. This is Jesus talking to Peter. What about you? And He's asking you right now. What about you? Who do you say that I am? At Rooted Right, we've just said a couple of weeks now, if you had an exit interview and you got to sit down with Jesus, and he's sitting there in the room with you and he says, who do you say that I am? You get a chance to fill in that blank. If you don't know how you would answer that, I just encourage you to go and get the information about who Jesus is so that you can make your decision about whether or not he's Lord and Savior of your life. Are you a friend of God? Let us pray. Father, You're such an awesome God. We come to You in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank You so much for this time in Your Word. Your Word is so awesome. We serve a living God and we get to dive into the living Word. It's not stale. It's not dead. It's got deep revelation for us each and every day. Lord, I thank You for the men that have listened to this message. And I know there's many in here that would call themselves a friend of God and have been living their lives in a way that's bearing much good fruit. Lord, we know that Your Word says we all sin and fall short, which is why we need a Savior. None of us have it all together, and we're not living a perfect life here on earth. But Lord, You know our heart position. And I pray this morning that our heart says we want to serve You with all our heart, our soul, and our mind. We know that at the back end of that, Lord, that You're going to get all the praise, honor, and glory, and the perfect will of God will be done. 
Lord, I pray over each and every man in this room. I pray that you would give us the ability <clears throat> to walk in the roles that you designed us to walk in. Whether that's to be great spouses uh, to our wives, godly men and examples to our children, raising up our children in the ways of the Lord, or operating our businesses in a way that builds your kingdom and glorifies you with all the gifts and talents, all the provision that you've given us. It's all yours anyways, Lord. And we just thank you that that we can actually be used by an almighty God. We thank you that uh, you've never given up on us. Lord, you've always loved us. You're always standing at our heart and knocking. And Lord, we just have to let you in. I pray that we'd get ourselves out of the way so that you may be glorified. Lord, your word says the plans of a man are many, but the will of the Lord will prevail. I pray the perfect will of God over each and every man in this room and anybody that would listen to this message. I pray for the favor of the Lord to be upon us. I pray that we would truly know what it feels like and live out by serving in Ephesians 3.20 God that says now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask or think according to your power that works in us. We put this all into your hands. We trust that you have a great plan for it all. We thank you for this time of fellowship and for your word. I pray that it would take root and that we would see a great harvest. And Lord, testimonies would flow out of the mouths of each and every man in this room. And that testimony says, Lord, do it again with the same power and authority. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, men, for being here. It's a blessing. And if you need to get plugged into anything, please, uh, that's why we're here, One Call Men's Ministry. If this hits you that you need to get plugged into a men's group, otherwise, second Saturday of every month, we'll see you here. And love to see you at church if you don't have a home church. Love you guys.